thank Justin Kobe uh, a few minutes to introduce him. But last year, Innovative Solutions started uh, a tech conference with the Hyatt, uh, probably 250 people. They put it together rather quickly. It was a fabulous event. This is the next stage of that, and I'm very, very proud that it's growing this year, bigger crowd this year. We hope this is something that, that grows every single year. Uh, the whole technology sector, you're part of the Rochester in this region. And one of the things I've always found in my previous careers is we're the most understated community. People don't really know what we have. When you really get in and see the companies and talent we have here, it is world class. It really is. And today's a day where I think we're going to have a chance to learn, hopefully connect, I hope you walk away with relationships, business cards, connectivity here, and learn something. Because the whole day is filled with uh, two world class speakers uh, for uh, you know, really both authors that we give in the morning and afternoon uh, addresses and a series of, of workshops and breakout sessions, which I think really has some super, super talent here. Uh, so it's a day that we're very, very proud of. Uh, as I look at the, the board here, uh, it's Austin Innovative Solutions is perhaps the, the uh, leaders with this in terms of coming together as a partnership. And I give Justin and Innovative Solutions really all the credit for starting this, but this would not happen without a lot of sponsors. And, and I'm going to read them all, but up on the board and, and the back of your pamphlet here, uh, you have, I guess, 26 different sponsors uh, who have really weighed in. They really make this happen. Uh, other people that make it happen as well is behind the scenes of talent. Justin will, will thank uh, his team. Well, I'm going to thank the Chamber team. When I look at the back room, uh, I have Susan George from our events team. She's our quarterback for events. Her, Michelle Heffron, people in white shirts from our Chamber are here. A lot of work goes in between the Chamber of Innovative Solutions and, and also the Convention Center to make this happen. Really, a lot of behind the scenes work. CMI is doing our technology. They are fantastic. So, a great partnership, great teamwork, and it's something I hope you really enjoy throughout the day. Uh, one of our, our key sponsors, I, I share, I'll say our, our uh, number one uh, key major sponsor is Just Solutions. Uh, they are, again, a world class local company with IT services, uh, a variety of services and products they have. Very well known, a great company. Uh, but they came up as a major sponsor, and I can't thank them enough. I think right in front of the table here, but I want to invite the VP Dave Wolf to come up and say a few words. So, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Just Solutions or not. Uh, we've been in business over 20 years, so if you haven't heard of us, I guess that makes us the best kept secret. Uh, over the past four years, we've made the Rochester Top 100 three times. So we have been growing uh, quite steadily over the past few years. And uh, over the past two years, uh, recently, the RBJ readers have voted us the number one IT outsource company. So if you're not familiar with us, I would really recommend that you come by our booth and get to know us. Uh, one of the things we want to offer you is a free dark web scan. A lot of you may not be familiar with how to search the dark web, uh, but we'll be happy to do a free scan for you and show you how your company is exposed on the dark web. Uh, so, I, we're very excited to be a sponsor this year and uh, to try to get our name out there so more businesses can learn about us. I uh, look forward to a great conference. I hope you really get enjoyment out of it and a lot of knowledge out of it. So, please stop by and see us. Uh, again, thank you for letting us be a sponsor this year. Justin Kobe is the CEO of Innovative Solutions. I mentioned Justin uh, started this last year with a conference. And one of the things that, that really most impressed me when he started last year, he invited many people in the room here who are competitors. And when you invite your competitors into a session to learn and grow, uh, some, may, some with smaller minds may think it may put them at a disadvantage. I think Justin felt just the opposite. And by doing that, I just believe you raise the whole ecosystem here. This is one of our core strengths and to bring this whole technology sector together, the great minds we have here in this community to elevate it. You need people to come together, work together, and collaborate. And I just want to thank Justin personally uh, for doing that, leading the way last year for leading it this way. But I thought just his leadership in bringing people that you compete in the marketplace with together in a room where everybody walks away with something a little bit different, a little, maybe a little st stronger, some more ideas about growing the business. I think it's something that really elevates all of us. So, again, the person who started this last year, I please welcome the CEO uh, of Innovative Solutions, Justin Kobe. Justin. All right, who's ready? This is the event. This is it. 
This is the only tech conference in Western New York. Literally. There's nothing like this event. I am so excited for today. I got goosebumps. We have two amazing keynote presentations. We have breakout sessions all day. And we have this extremely diverse ecosystem of tech companies in our community here to share ideas. I could not be more thrilled. I take zero credit. I take zero accolades. The Chamber, our team at Innovative, worked tirelessly to put this on. And I cannot thank them enough. Over the summer, I had the opportunity to read a book called The Third Door. And it's, a, it's an interesting story. It's actually an interesting set of stories. The irony behind it is the author, Alex Benayan, who I'm going to welcome up here in a moment, is a third door story in and of, him, him and of himself. He went on The Price is Right. He hacked it. He won a sailboat. He sold the sailboat to fund his dream to write the book he always wanted to read. He is interviewed arguably the world's most famous, incredible, successful people. People that never get interviewed. And we're going to get him here for an hour today to share a little bit of that wisdom. And I am so thrilled. Please welcome Alex Benayah. Alex. Let's give him one more round of applause, guys. So, as I said, my name is Alex, and for the past seven years, I've been obsessively studying success. I've spent thousands of hours researching, going through hundreds of biographies, and most importantly, sitting down one-on-one -on -one with the people I was dying to get answers from. As you mentioned, you know, for business, I spoke to Bill Gates, music Lady Gaga, science Jane Goodall. You know, Quincy Jones, Jessica Alba, Larry King. It's been this unbelievable journey filled with surprising lessons at every turn. And what I want to do with you guys today, this morning, is share not only the most surprising lessons, but also share some of the most fun stories from how this whole journey got started. Because if there's one thing that's important in the tech world, is really understanding the origins of how something gets going. So to take you back seven years, I was 18 years old, a freshman in college, and I was spending every day lying on my dorm room bed, staring up at the ceiling. By a show of hands, how many people here have gone through at some point the what I want to do with my life crisis? And don't have fast, give me full arms and be honest with me. Okay, great, 98% of the room and 2% liar, so we're in a good place right now. <laughs> So if you guys have gone through this, you know this is what, it's an all-consuming crisis where it's what you think about when you go to bed, it's what you think about in the shower, and to understand why I was going through it. You have to understand that I'm the son of Persian immigrants, which essentially means I came out of the womb, my mom cradled me in her arms, and then she stamped ND on my ass and sent me on my way. You know, you think it's funny, but in third grade, I wore scrubs to school for Halloween and thought I was cool. You know, that was my childhood growing up. And in high school, I checked the boxes, I studied, you know, for the SATs, I applied as a pre-med, and when I got to college, I was pre-med of pre-meds. But very quickly, I remember, you know, being up at dorm room bed, looking at this towering stack of biology books, feeling like they were sucking the life out of me. And at first I assumed, you know, maybe I'm just being lazy. But eventually I began to wonder, maybe I'm not on my path. Maybe I'm on a path that somebody placed me on and I'm just throwing down. So now not only do I not know what I want to do with my life, I have no idea how all the people who I looked up to, how did they do it? Now how did Bill Gates sell his first piece of software out of his dorm room when nobody knew his name? Or how did Spielberg become the youngest director in Hollywood history without a single hit under his belt. 
you know, these are things they don't teach you in school. So just very naively, I went to the library assuming the hat to be a book of the answers. So I'm just ripping through business books and biographies and self-help books, you know, all the books you have in your office, and eventually I was left empty-handed. And that's when my naive 18-year-old thinking kicked in, and I thought, well, no one's written the book I'm dreaming of reading. Why not write it myself? And you know, I thought it would be this very easy three-month summer project. I would just call up Bill Gates, interview him, interview everybody else. I thought it would be done in like a few months. That, I assumed, would be the easy part. The hard part, I figured, was getting the money to fund the journey. I was buried into student loan debt. I was all out of our rents cash. So there had to be a way to make some quick money. So two nights before final exams, I was in the library doing what everyone's doing in the library right before finals. I'm on Facebook. And I'm on Facebook, and I see someone offering free tickets to The Price is Right. And again, by show of hands, how many of you watched The Price is Right growing up? Okay, perfect. So you guys are all gonna understand the gravity of this. I see someone offering free tickets to the show, and I'm going to college, you know, just a few miles away from the shows where it's being filmed. And my first thought is, what if I go on the show and want some money to fund this dream? You know, not my brightest moment. Plus, I had a problem. I had never seen a full episode of the show before. I've, of course, you know, seen bits and pieces when I was in fourth grade homesick from school. I'd never seen a full episode before. So, you know, I told myself it was a dumb idea to not think about it. But I remember... You know, I don't know if you guys have ever had one of these moments where an idea just keeps clawing itself back into your mind. You know, you tell yourself it's preposterous, but the idea just keeps clawing itself back. So to prove to myself it was a dumb idea, and I remember sitting in this little round table in the corner of the library, and I opened my spiral notebook, and I write, you know, best and worst case scenarios at the top to prove to myself it's a bad idea. And I remember writing, you know, worst case scenarios, fatal finals get kicked out of pre-med, lose financial aid, mom stops talking to me, no, mom kills me. You know, there's like 20 cons. And the only pro was maybe, maybe, I want enough money to fund this dream. And it was almost as if somebody had tied a rope around my gut and was slowly going in a direction. So that night, I decided to do the logical thing and pull an all-nighter to study but I didn't study for finals, I studied how to hack the prices right. So, I, you know, I wake up the next morning after this all-nighter, and what I had learned about the prices right is they make it look very random. You know, the, the announcer is like, Bob, come on down, as if they pulled your name out of a hat. But in reality, there's a producer who interviews every single person in the audience before the show begins. And on top of that, I learned there's also an undercover producer who then gets the list from the main producer and confirms or denies the selection. So, you know, I get to the Price is Right studio that morning, and I don't know who the undercover producer is, so I just have to assume everyone is. So I'm, you know, dancing with old ladies, I'm flirting with custodians, I'm breakdancing, I don't know how to break dance, and I'm waiting, and eventually it's my turn to be interviewed by the producer. And the second I see him, He's maybe over there with Can you put your hand up in the black blazer? Yeah, right there. He's about that far away from me. And the second I see him, I know that's my guy. His name is Stan, and I knew everything about him because I researched him the night before. I knew where he grew up. I knew where he went to school. I essentially knew what he ate for breakfast that morning. And the second I saw him, I knew Stan has a method to his moves. You know, he walks up and down this long... Railing, and he's like, what's your name, where are you from, what do you do? What's your name, where are you from, what do you do? And if he likes you, he'll ask you some more questions. And if he really likes you, he'll turn around to his assistant who's sitting about 20 feet away. He'll wink, and she'll put your name on his clipboard. If the price is right as the nightclub, Stan is the bouncer. And if you're not on his list, you're out. So eventually, the bouncer's right in front of me. And he's like, what's your name, where are you from, what do you do? And I'm like, hey, I'm not on I'm 18, you know, I'm a freshman in college, I'm pre-med. And he goes, oh, pre-med, um, you must spend a lot of time studying. How do you have time to watch the prices, right? 
And I'm like, oh, is that where I am? No laughter. You know, the joke just dies. So I'm freaking out, and I see his eyes darting, and I had read in one of those business books I had read during my life crisis that human contact speeds up a relationship. So I had an idea. I had to touch Stan. <laughs> but, you know, I had a problem. There was a railing in front of me, so I'm like, Stan, come over here. I want to make a handshake with you. He's like, no, no, it's okay. And I'm like, come on. So he eventually comes over, and I teach him how to pound it and blow it up. And he laughs a little, and he's like, all right, kid, good luck. And he starts walking away. And as he's walking away, he doesn't turn around, doesn't wait to his assistant. She just writes it on the clipboard. And just like that, it's over. And this was one of those moments where you can see you know, your entire dream walking away from you. Almost like sand spinning through your fingers. And the worst part is, you know, you didn't even have a chance to fully prove yourself. So I don't know what got into me, but I just started feeling this rumbling in the pit of my stomach. And I started yelling at the top of my lungs, STAND! And you know, the whole audience shoots their head around thinking I'm having like a seizure. And he runs over and he's like, are you okay? Are you okay? What's going on? And I have no idea what I'm going to say. And I'm looking at him, and you have to understand, Stan is very typical Hollywood. You know, turtleneck, red scarf, even though it's 70 degrees outside. And I'm just looking at him, and I'm like, you're a scarf! And now I really don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> so he's looking at me, I'm looking at him, and you can feel the tension. And all I can think of is I just look at him with all the seriousness I can, and I'm like, Stan, I'm an avid scarf collector. I have 362 pairs in my dorm room, and I'm missing out one. Where did you get it? And he starts cracking up <laughs> because I think he finally realized what I was trying to do, and he's laughing more at why I was doing it. So he gives me his scarf. He's like, "Look, you need this more than I do." <laughs> he turns around, winks, and his assistant makes him walk on the board. So at that point, you know, I'm feeling really good, and I start, you know, moving around through the audience. And, you know, I'm still waiting my turn, and I see this young woman with, you know, long brown hair. And she's looking around the audience a lot, looking at the people's name tags. And then I notice she has a laminated badge in her back pocket. I'm like, this has to be the undercover producer. So I look at her, and I start dancing, and I start, you know, blowing her kisses, and she's laughing. And I'm dancing more, and she takes out a sheet of paper. <coughs> looks at my name tag, and makes another mark. So at this point, you know, you would think I'm feeling on top of the world, but that's when I realized I had spent my entire all-nighter studying how to get on the show. I still didn't know how to play. You know, no big deal, no worries. I take out my phone and I Google, you know, how to play Prices Right. <laughs> Not rocket science. You know, how to play Prices Right. 30 seconds later, feel on top of my shoulder, and security takes the phone away. And at this point, you know, I'm an 18-year-old without a phone. I'm, I'm useless. <laughs> and I remember sitting down on this bench next to this old, older woman with you know, silver hair, and I don't have a plan B, and I, I'm just sulking him. She looks at me, and she can sense something's wrong, and she goes, Connie, what's, what's the matter? I, I tell her, I tell her about my dream, I tell her about finals, I tell her about the book, and I tell her I've never seen a full episode of the show before. She's like, honey, you remind me of my grandson. And she pinches my cheek. And I'm like, any chance, you know, you have any advice on the show? Have you, have you watched it before? She's like, honey, I've been watching the show for 50 years. And she ends up giving me tremendous wisdom, you know, in a matter of minutes. And it's downloading into my brain. And the light bulb goes off. You know, I give her a big hug, I say thank you. And then I jump to the person next to me. I'm like, hey, I'm Alex, I'm 18, I've never seen the show before, do you have any advice? You know, hey, I'm Alex, I'm 18, I've never seen the show before, do you have any advice? And then over the course of an hour, I end up crowdsourcing the wisdom of the audience. And finally, the doors to the studio open. You know, you step in there, and the place smells like the 1970s. <laughs> you know, there's flashing lights on the walls, 
green and yellow drapes, you know, all that's missing is a disco ball, and you get in there, and, you know, I'm not super religious, but if there was ever a point to pray, it was then, and I remember, you know, closing my eyes, and saying a prayer, and I hear this loud, rumbling noise from up above. Long, elongated syllables. You know, but it wasn't God. It was TV God. Live from CBS Studio in Hollywood, it's The Price is Right! And you know, they called out the first contestant, and the second contestant, it's not me, and the third contestant, it's not me, and the fourth, you know, I feel it coming, so I literally edge myself off in my chair. Still not me. And I remember, you know, sinking back in my chair and thinking, you know, maybe it was just not meant to be. But as you guys know, the way the show works is someone wins an opening round, moves on, and now there's an empty podium. And it's time for the fifth contestant. Alex Benayan, come on down! And I lose my shit. You know, it is impossible, as much as you think you're super zen, it is impossible to be calm in that moment. I'm running down the aisle, I'm hugging strangers, I get to the podium, and without a second to think, they're like, a leather chair and ottoman! I'm 18, you know, I don't know how much milk costs. I don't even know what ottoman means, you know, so... I'm like, $400! And the audience laughs at me, and, you know, it was way above that, so I lose that round. But before I know it, it's time for the next round. A new billiards table! And I'm thinking, cousins have a billiards table. How expensive could it be? So I'm like, $600! And again, the audience laughs at me, but the other contestants, because the audience laughed so loud, bid higher and higher and higher, and they all overbid, so I win by default! So I'm jumping up and down, I'm running onto the stage, I'm like, oh my god, this is amazing, what do I win? And they're like, you win the billiards table. I'm like, okay, great. So, you know, I'm learning as the show goes on, and I'm happy my embarrassment is your amusement. And, you know, now it's time for the bonus round. And the doors open, and there, it's this, you know, glistening, beautiful hot tub. You know, 12 jets, LED lights, a waterfall, and all I can think is if I win this hot tub, I am the king of college. So, you know, all the pressure's on. And I guess $4,000, it was $9,000. I lose the hot tub. I think I'm over, but they go, we'll be right back with the wheel. And who here, who here is a giant prices right fan? Who knows the show in and out? What's your name, sir? Mike. Mike, ever give Mike some love. with all the passion you can, the 10 second rundown of what the wheel is. You spin this giant wheel, the goal is to get a dollar or as close to a dollar as you can. If you get higher than the three other contestants, you move on to the showcase show. 100%, give Mike some love. So Mike knows it better than I do, because when I got there, I'm looking at this giant slot machine come onto the stage. And, you know, the first person goes up, so there's three of us, the first woman goes up, and, you know, this young, peppy woman, curly hair, she gives it a spin. 80. And, you know, even I know that's an unbelievable spin. You know, the audience is cheering, I'm cheering for her. Now it's my turn. And I go up there, and I, you know, I don't know what to do, and I think I might as well have some fun with this. So I grab onto the handles, and it might be it's heavier than it looks. You know, I give it a spin. 85. And the audience goes ballistic, because they know, I know, I have no idea what's going on. So they're cheering, I'm cheering, I'm like their dumb younger brother, and they're loving it. And now it's time for the final woman to spin. And it's this older woman, and really sweet, everyone's rooting for her. She gives it a spin. 50. And Mike, what happens if you're under? You get a second spin. You get a second spin, which apparently everybody knows except me. So, you know, it's like Blackjack, you get a second spin, and now it's time for her to spin again, and she goes... 
55. She goes over, and I win, and I start freaking out. Because I think I just won the whole show. <laughs> so I'm jumping up and down. I'm waving to my mom on camera, and they'll be and they're like, we'll be right back with the second half. The price is right. And I'm like, <laughs> they move me to the side of the stage, and I find out who's going up against me in the second half of the show. And her name is Tanisha. And she blasted through the second half of the price is right with the ferociousness of someone who has spent her whole life walking through Costco studying price tax. <laughs> you know, she won the opening round. She won the bonus round. And on the wheel, she spun a perfect 100. <laughs> you know, going up against Tanisha is like David going up against Goliath, and David didn't bring a slick shot. So, you know, Tanisha comes up onto the stage, and, you know, I believe in karma to a degree, and I reach in my hand and I'm, I'm like, good luck. She looks me up and down and goes, yeah, you'll need it. And the whole audience is like, oh shit! <laughs> you know, it's super heated now on the stage of The Price is Right. And I'm thinking, fuck, she's right, I do need it. So I'm in a panic. I see the host of the show, it's the new host, it's Drew Carey. And I realized that I had, you know, when I was getting advice from everyone before the show, no one was giving me advice on the final round because no one thought I'd make it this far. So I'm realizing I have no idea what to do and I see the host of the show and all I can think is I put my hands up in the air and I'm like, Drew, I loved you on Whose Line Is It Anyway? And I give him a hug and you know, he sort of pushes me away. And I'm like, hey Drew, um, any advice on the showroom showdown? And he puts a finger up in my face and he goes, first of all, it's the showcase showdown. <laughs> you know, clearly I have no idea what I'm talking about. And he ends up giving this great advice. And before I know it, it's time to go behind the podium. And you have to understand, I'm standing there. And there's, you know, six machine gun sized cameras pointed on my face. <laughs> ten blinding white lights in my eyes. I'm sweating. Tanisha's dancing. And now it's time for the final round. And the way it works, as you all know, is you get a bunch of prizes and you have to guess the final price. And it's time for my first prize. Alex, your first prize is a trip to Six Flags Magic Mountain Theme Park. Who here has been to Six Flags Theme Park? You, it's 50 bucks for the can of Coke. You know, it's not hard to know. Everyone's seen these commercials. It's like 50 bucks to go to a game show. And then I hear blah, 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 blah. Now, I didn't know those details were important. <laughs> so, what I heard is, you know, Six Flags theme park, but I guess what the audience also heard in those details is that it was front of the line passes, all you can eat food, VIP, with the butler, in a limo, for six people. But I'm feeling good, 50 bucks, next. <laughs> Your next prize is a trip to Florida, blah, 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 blah. I'm 18. I've never booked a plane ticket before. What is it like? 100 bucks, 200 bucks. Again, what I didn't hear in the details is that it was first class tickets, rental car, five star hotel for two people. But I'm feeling good. 200 bucks, easy, next. While you're in Florida, a trip into zero gravity, blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking this is another theme park, so I assume another $50. <laughs> I did not understand that this is at, in Cape Canaveral, at the Kennedy Space Center, and this is how NASA trains their astronauts. Every 15 minutes in zero gravity is $5,000. But you know, no worries, I'm thinking 50 bucks easy, and they're like, and your grand prize, and the door's open, a new sailboat! And, you know, of course, I'm jumping up and down. I'm super excited. But then I calm down, and I look at the boat. And it's back to where the corner of that room is, where that little tree is. It's pretty far. From where I'm standing, it sort of looks like a dinghy. <laughs> and again, I'm like, you're thinking, how much can a dinghy cost? You know, $4,000, $3,000. You know, not that much. What I didn't hear 
is that it was a Catalina Mark II sailboat with a cabin and a trailer. But I'm thinking, all right, cool, definitely four thousand dollars tops. <laughs> Alex, this will all be yours if the price is right. And you know, the audience is cheering. And now it's my turn to figure out the answer. And if there was ever a point in life where you have to listen to that inner voice, it was then. And I remember closing my eyes and just listening to that voice. And just, I'm going to tell myself, I'm going to trust my gut. This one number just felt right. $6,000. Dead silence. It's as if somebody has passed away on the stage of The Price is Right. And I'm looking at the audience who have been, you know, having my back all day. I'm looking at them confused why they're not cheering. And then I realize the host, Drew Carey, hasn't locked in my answer. And I look at Drew Carey, and he's like, <laughs> and eventually I get the hint and I reach for the mic and I'm like just kidding? and everybody starts cheering he's like oh college kids these days what's your real answer? and I'm thinking fuck that was my real answer <laughs> so I have no idea what I'm doing and literally I just start pounding on the podium Audience, I need your help. And like a miracle, they start chanting one number. But it's a mob, and I can't understand a mob. So, you know, I hear them chanting, blah, 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 and the producer are trying to cut me off. They're like, we need an answer. And I hear the audience, you know, I hear the TH sound, and I'm like, all right, I'm going with the audience. $300. <laughs> Drew Carey grabs the microphone back and goes, you know there's a difference between 30,000 and 30,000, right? And I'm like, of course I know that, just kidding again. And he's like, great, we're locking in at 30,000, moving on. <laughs> Tanisha looks at me like she's going up against someone from preschool. <laughs> and, you know, Tanisha gets her prizes, she gets a new car and an ATV and a vacation, and she guesses, I believe, somewhere around, you know, $35,000. And now it's time to reveal the winner. Tanisha, you guessed $35,000. Retail price, $36,400. And Tanisha jumps in the air, thanking God that she just wanted you a car. And I remember standing there behind my podium, just doing crisis management, thinking, you know, I go straight to the library. I have three hours for bio, two hours for prep. Mom doesn't even know I'm here. You know, I'm just trying to figure out what to do for finals at, at this point now. And they're like, Alex, you get $30,000, retail price, blah, 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 blah. They're not listening. But I see the audience explode. And the producers start pointing at me. And then I notice my podium is flashing. So I literally turn around to look at it. <laughs> I guessed $30,000. Retail price, $31,200. I beat Tanisha by $200. My face literally goes from this to... Ah! You know, I'm jumping around. I jump on the sailboat. I get the sailboat, sell the sailboat, and that's how I funded the book. And, you know, the past seven years, have been an equally wild adventure from that point on. You know, it took two years to get to Bill Gates, it took three years to get to Lady Gaga, and what I want to do with you guys for, you know, the second half of this morning's session is spend the time going really deep into Q&A, hearing what you guys are working on with your businesses, with your tech companies, and going really deep into the challenges you're facing and the questions you have so we can make this super personal and intimate. What I will share before we get into Q&A in a minute is that with The Price is Right, one of the biggest lessons I learned is also one of the biggest lessons I learned from seven years of doing interviews. You know, when I had started, I had zero intention for finding that you know, one key to success. You know, we've all seen those TED Talks or business books where they're talking about one key to success or, Normally I just roll my eyes. 
But eventually, you know, after doing this for seven years, I've realized that every single person I interview, it doesn't matter if it's Maya Angelou who grew up in Stamps, Arkansas, or Warren Buffett who grew up in Omaha, no matter what their industry, no matter where they're from, they all treat life and business and success the exact same way. And the analogy that came to me is that it's sort of like getting into a nightclub. There's always three ways in. So there's the first door, the main entrance, where the line curves around the block, where 99% of people wait around hoping to get in. That's the first door. And then there's the second door, the VIP entrance, where the billionaires and celebrities go through. And for some reason, society has this way of making us feel like those are the only two ways in. We're either born into it, or you wait your turn like everybody else. But what I've learned is that there's always, always the third door. And it's the entrance where you jump out of line, run down the alley, bang on the door a hundred times, crack open the window, go through the kitchen, there's always a way in. And it doesn't matter if that's how Gates sold his first piece of software or how Lady Gaga got her first record deal, they all took the third door. So if there's one thing I can leave you guys with, as, you know, the whole, you know, I think it's really interesting that we started the day with this session because my dream is that this energy carries throughout all the other sessions. In the sense of you guys all, whether you know it or not, have already taken the third door to starting your tech companies and being part of the chamber and the ecosystem here in Rochester. And what I want is that for it to go from the back of your mind to the forefront. That you're more cognizant of not only the third doors you had, you've already taken to get to where you are, but the ones that you'll need to take to get to where you want to go. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. And the, you know, the more personal the questions, the more poignant, the more fun I'll be, and the more fire I can bring. So let's see who is our first person. Yes, what's your name? Mark. Everyone give Mark some love. So a lot of focus goes to strategy, but I don't believe that's the answer. How do they get themselves to do the work every day despite all of the negativity, you can't do this? I read a little bit about Bill Gates. How do they get themselves inspired to do the hard stuff that most of us are unwilling to do? That's a great question. You know, there's this great story of the first time Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have ever met. And you know, Microsoft was really exploding at that time, and Bill Gates' mom was planning this, you know, family picnic kind of day, you know, outside of Seattle. And she's like, oh, Bill, this, this man Warren Buffett is coming, and Bill's like, oh, I am not, I don't have time to talk to a, a stockbroker. I don't care how rich he is. And his mom's like, oh, Bill, you just talked to him for an hour, he's coming all the way from Omaha to come see you. So Bill Gates literally helicopters into his like, family picnic to come talk to this guy for like 10 minutes. And they end up going into hours and hour long discussions and they become inseparable. And that night at dinner, you know, they're still sitting and talking and Bill Gates' dad asks, you know, he has Bill Gates and Warren Buffett sitting next to each other for the first time ever. And at dinner he goes, I want to know if you could attribute your single, you know, your, all the success that you've accomplished, the both of you, to a single word, a single trait, what would it be? And at the same time, instantly, they both go, focus. At the same time, they both say focus. And the interesting thing about that is if you zoom out even more, you look at, you know, it doesn't matter, you look at Steve Jobs. One of his most famous quotes is saying, focus isn't saying no to the good ideas. It's saying no to the great ones. And the whole point, and the reason I bring this up, is because the essence of your question is I think it has a lot less to do on inspire. You know, you, go, you hear any motivational speaker, and they're talking about, you know, you know, inspiring yourself and fueling yourself with inspiration. And I think, yes, that's important. But I also think what's even more important 
is having a singular focus on what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because I think while inspiration is important to fuel you with good energy, and I don't want to understate it, I think what's even more critical is knowing exactly what you're doing, knowing exactly why you're doing it, so you can then say no to the other options and to the other good ideas. And a good litmus test that I've seen that some of the best CEOs do is when they're worried whether the companies are focused or not. And I'll actually challenge you guys, because I know a lot of you guys are entrepreneurs here or you're executives at tech companies in Rochester. Go around to your office tomorrow. And don't make this a formal survey, because then you'll get bullshit answers. But just walk around the office tomorrow and just start asking people. Ask 10 people. What do you, what, what do you think is our number one priority of this quarter? If you're not getting, you know, 9 out of 10 of the same answers, you need to work on refocusing the organization. And I think that's the most important thing when it comes to achieving a goal, is making sure not only is everyone on board, but everybody knows exactly where you're going. And I think that's 100 times more valuable than any amount of inspiration. That's a great question. Thank you. Yes, in the back, what's your name? Everyone give Lori some love. <laughs> Lori is bringing the fire. I feel it right now. I just want to know what mom said. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> 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 what, what mom said after the crisis, right? You know, there's something about Jewish parents where when you come home with a sailboat, as much as what you did is against all the rules, it's hard for them to get mad in that moment. But what did end up happening is, you know, after the, the price is right, I finally had my money to go on this journey. And what ended up happening is, you know, Bill Gates was my biggest dream interview. And not only was it my biggest dream interview, it to me was the holy grail of this mission. Because I had this original thought that, you know, it's a very 18 year old thought of, if there's anyone on earth who would have the answers to what I'm looking for, it had to be Bill Gates. So I had this picture taped up above my bed, above my bathroom sink, and my car dashboard. From 18 to 20 was my number one focus. And it took about a year, but finally, I got on the phone with Bill Gates' chief of staff. And he said, look, we love what you're doing, but you know, we're not doing this until you can, you know, we, we don't do interviews with 18-year-old blogs. You know, go get a publishing deal from Penguin or Random House, go build more momentum and cause back. So that set me off on this journey to go get a publishing deal. And when I finally was, you know, on the 99 yard line, just inches away from making it happen, I was sort of faced with this ultimatum where I knew that most authors, even successful authors, in this day and age are having trouble getting book deals. And I knew that being in school full time was taking all of my energy and all of my focus, and my junior year of college was about to start. So I was sort of faced with this ultimatum of, I knew if I focused on school, I wouldn't be able to make the book proposal, the book deal, everything I knew it could be. And if I knew if I focused everything on the book deal, my grades would start slipping, I went to a private university, and it wasn't easy for our family to pay tuition. And you know, I'd be wasting my time and wasting my energy there. And I, I've learned that you, in life, can either do two things half-assed or one thing great. And one of the hardest things for me, beyond telling my mom that I wasn't, you know, going to final so I could be on the prices right, was telling her that I was going to take this semester off focus on the book because my mom is smart and she said 
a semester off, my son is not going to be a college dropout. And it pretty much started World War III in our family. And the reason I bring that up is because at the time, I thought this was my mom just going crazy for crazy sake. And I love my mom. The reason I am who I am is because of her. But I thought at that time she was just going crazy for no reason. And only now in hindsight can I see that she came to this country with one dream. That if she sacrificed everything to give me and my sisters an education, we wouldn't have to suffer the way she suffered growing up. And by taking that semester off and eventually leaving school, what I was essentially doing for her was turning my back on everything she's worked on. So making that decision was actually the hardest one in my life. Now, one of the beautiful things about this book is that the journey is not only a testament to you know, what it takes to succeed, it's also a testament to the unconditional love of the family. And when the book came out three months ago, my mom was standing by my side in New York City cheering louder than anybody else. All right, who's got the next one? Yes, what's your name? Sherry. Ever give Sherry some love? What was your most surprising interview that you you thought going in you would learn, but what what was the most unusual interview you ever did? Mm. Okay, so the question for those in the back is, what was the most surprising interview? And by far the most surprising one was with Quincy Jones. You know, you walk into Quincy Jones' house, and this was towards the end of the journey. You walk in, and you see him, and he's he looks like the alchemist. You know, he has this long blue robe with, like, gold trim along the edges. He walks in, and he's like, where are you from, my man? And I'm like, oh, I'm from Los Angeles. And he's like, no. I said, where are you from? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, my parents are Persian. And he's like, that's what I thought. <laughs> you know, and he just starts going 100 miles an hour in stories about his travels in Iran, and... What I thought would be, you know, a typical hour-long interview turned into this three-hour whirlwind in his house. And one of the most surprising things I learned, you know, that interview with Quincy Jones, I can say with confidence, was the only interview on the whole journey where I walked in one person and I walked out another. Now, one of the most interesting things he shared, that I think is one of the most applicable and practical things you guys can walk away from, is that he helped me understand, without even telling me explicitly, that one of the biggest preconceived notions I had going into this journey was completely wrong. You know, I always assumed, you know, this whole journey really is this question of understanding success. Understanding not only how did people start out, but how did they really maintain it once they achieved it? And if I were to ask you guys, you know, what's the opposite of success, what would you say? Failure. Failure. You know, it's the most obvious answer. And that's what I was operating with. What Quincy Jones helped me realize is that success and failure aren't opposites. Because if you think about it, success and failure are just this, you know, different results of the same thing. Trying. So the opposite of success isn't failure. The opposite of success is not trying. And we're talking about this too. At Innovative, you have this whole thing of, you know, failure is part of the process. And I think what's actually underneath that thought is what Quincy Jones was saying. Which is that the reason failure is part of the process is because failure is a result of the same thing that leads to innovation, which is trying. Every person that you talk to, every great inventor, every great innovator always says that failure is part of the process. And while you know, Silicon Valley talks about failing fast and failing often, I don't think that's the goal. I think it's about trying fast and trying often. And if failure comes as a result, great. And if success comes as a result, great. But if you focus on trying, 
You know, there's this great, if you guys are football fans, there's this great motto that said, the scoreboard takes care of itself. The scoreboard takes care of itself. And if you focus on that, and if you just keep trying and keep trying better, that's when things start working out. That's a great question. Thank you. Yes. So what was your name? Uh, Mark. Mark, everyone get Mark some love. I read the oh, book. Thank you. Hello. Um, so and if people haven't read the book, you, you've got to pick it up. I mean, the three of us have read it. Um, it, it it'll take, you, you'll pick it up. You won't be able to put it down. You'll read it within 24 hours. It's, it's an amazing, amazing story and journey. Where are you headed next? I mean, I, I know that I'm going to be reading about you and listening to you 5, 10, 15 years down the road. What, what, what do you think is next in terms of your journey? I appreciate that. You know, one of the things that surprised me most on the journey itself was, you know, I set off in the beginning when I was 18 to create this book that I dreamed of reading. And I wanted it to be the most practical guidebook I could get. And while that still exists in the book, you know, you read it and there's Tim Ferriss' cold email tips, Bill Gates' negotiating secrets. While those practical pieces of wisdom are still in there, I think the soul of the book goes much deeper. And to me, the soul of the book is really about possibility. Now, what I've learned is that you can give someone all the best tools and knowledge in the world, and their life can still feel stuck. But if you change what someone believes is possible, will never be the same. And that's, you know, that realization came to me towards the end of the seven years. And I really think it's informing where I'm going from here. And, you know, there's this great anecdote, and, you know, when I was at your offices yesterday, I shared this, where there's this story that I came across in my research, where I learned that, there, you know, there's this story of a teacher for Teach for America teaching in Baltimore, you know, this really part, rough, rough part of town in this really tough school, and she's teaching, I think, third grade, and she goes, these kids need some inspiration today. So, you know, she's like, guys, instead of our math lesson today, we're all going to drop pictures of our biggest dream in life. And she passes out sheets of paper and crayons, and all the kids start coloring, you know, their biggest dream of what they want to be when they grow up. And the teacher looks in the back of the room and there's a young boy who won't pick up a crayon. And it's been about 30 minutes and his face is still blank. But eventually his eyes light up and he starts coloring. And at the end, you know, the teacher collects all the papers and the kids go home. And she's going through them. And she sees that that young boy drew a picture of a pizza delivery. Of course, the teacher was concerned, so she called the mother that evening. The mother, though, wasn't surprised. She said that the only male figure in his life who's not in jail or on drugs is his uncle who delivers pizza. And what I took from that story is that young people will always reach for the highest branch they believe is possible. They will always reach for the highest branch they think is possible. So it's our job, whether it's schools or families or communities at large, to illuminate more branches. And that's my mission moving forward. Yes, what's your name? Susan. Ever give Susan some love? So uh, going into the, the book idea, um, how did you go about choosing your candidates for the book, for the interviews, and what was the, the, the most difficult one to get? Mm. Okay, the way the list came to be, so, you know, I win the prices right, I have this money, and now it's time to set off on the journey. And one of my first problems is asking myself exactly, okay, so I say I want to interview the world's most successful people. 
who is that? And, you know, it's easy to talk about and think about, but when you actually have to make a list, you know, it's sort of hard to make that list, because what I did know is I didn't believe in, you know, the Forbes 100. I didn't believe there was an algorithm to determine success. So who would be on my list? So I did the only thing I knew to do. I called my best friends for help. And one night, you know, we're all 18 years old. We get together at midnight in my room, and I ask them, guys, if we can make our dream university, who would be our professors? And it became really easy from there. You know, Bill Gates would teach business. Larry King would teach broadcasting. Spielberg would teach film. Jane Goodall would teach science. Maya Angelou would teach poetry. And from there is how we created the list. And that's what became my treasure map for the mission moving forward. Now, the hardest people to get to, definitely the hardest one was with Warren Buffett. We talked about this earlier. With Warren Buffett, it was this eight-month saga of trying to track him down. Because I assumed, all right, Bill Gates is going to be hard, but at least Warren Buffett always talks about wanting to help college kids. This is going to be great. You know, I spend a lot of time researching, and you know, I write this long letter for him, and you know, it takes me two months to make sure I know everything I can about him. I write this handwritten letter, I send it to his office, and he actually handwrites a response back. Now, I wrote a two-page letter, he wrote a two-sentence reply, but still, it was a handwritten response. And it essentially said, thank you, but no thank you, but I'm thinking, great, if he's handwriting a response, I'm like 99% there. You know, Warren Buffett is a handwriting response to everyone, so I'm thinking I'm almost there. So I decide it is going to be my number one focus to getting Warren Buffett, and I knew that I wanted him to be in the book more than he didn't want to be in the book. So I was like, all right, it's me versus him, I got this. To me, it felt like, you know, we were in Caesar's Palace in a boxing match, and I, no matter how many times I got punched in the face, I wasn't going to give up. And Warren Buffett really tested me. You know, I would write him letter after letter after letter. I would call his office every single Wednesday morning for eight months. Right. You have to understand. After, you know, a couple months of rejection, it starts wearing on you. By month seven, shit starts getting really dark. And every no, you know, there's this great quote by Paulo Coelho, the author of Alchemist, where he says, you know, if you are in school and you don't really care and you get an F on a test, it stinks. But when you're doing what you feel is your life's work, every no, every rejection is completely debilitating. And my identity was so wrapped up into the mission of this book that every no from Warren Buffett felt like, you know, he was winding his fist back and just hitting me in the gut, you know? And after eight months of no's, it felt like I was coughing up over and spitting up blood. And what ended up happening at this end of this really long journey, it was by far the hardest stretch of time, is I got on the phone with Buffett's assistant, you know, just like every other Wednesday, and at one point she was like, look, Alex, I know Warren, and I know when he says no, it's a no, but... You know, I really respect your persistence, and I know your, your heart's in the right place, so how about, as my guest, you come to our shareholders meeting? And I'm like, oh my god, thank you, thank you so much, because the shareholders meeting, you, the only way to get there is you either own your stock or you're part of the press. So I was like, wow, that's amazing. She's like, look, you can even bring friends. And I'm like, amazing, can I bring five friends? And she's like, absolutely, I'll send you the tickets. And I'm like, her name is Debbie, I'm like, Debbie, isn't it true, at the shareholders meeting, people can ask Mr. Buffett questions during the Q&A portion? She's like, Alex, Alex, Alex. <laughs> I know what you're trying to do, and it's not going to work. There's 30,000 people there, and 30 get to ask questions, and it's a random lottery. 
so your odds are one in a thousand, I wouldn't get your hopes up. But Debbie didn't know about me, because I am the king of hopes up. <laughs> so me and my best friends, who, you know, my boys who I grew up with, the same ones who I, you know, came up with the list, we all go to Omaha, we're, the six of us are sharing one room in the Motel 6, and we get to the stadium at 4 a.m., we're waiting in the blistering cold, and we get in there, and we decide we're going to figure out how Buffett's lottery works. And I just had a hunch that, just like The Price is Right, although people love to say that things in life are completely random, there's always a way. And we get in there, and we're running around, sharing our story, asking for advice, and eventually we find a loophole to Buffett's lottery system. And although they said it's completely random and the odds are one in a thousand, out of the six of us, four got winning lottery tickets. <laughs> so that's how the Buffett situation went down. Let's, we have time for two final ones. Yes, what's your name? Taylor. Ever give Taylor some love? <laughs> and whoever has that final question, make sure it is meaty. Oh, I got one for you, so don't worry. All right, let's hear it, Taylor, <laughs> bring it. So, over the course of my life, which is a lot young, 25 years old, I've always had that group of friends where there's that one guy, man, who we're always attracted to, or we always want to follow, we always want to go to battle with. Same with business. We always find that one guy that we always would go to battle for. Always. I'm sure you've asked the questions to the most successful CEOs, business leaders. How do leaders earn leadership? How do they make other people follow them? What's that one thing? What's that energy that makes other people want to do exactly what they want to do and go to battle with them? That's a good question. So if you're really looking at, you know, what it is that one woman, that one man that everybody wants to follow and feels compelled to follow, you know, the difference between a boss and a leader is you do what a boss says because you have to and you do what a leader says because you want to. That's the difference between a boss and a leader. And what I love that you mentioned is that it exists outside the workplace too. You look at the playground, there's that one person. And what I've learned, talking about all these different leaders, everybody in their own right is probably one of the greatest leaders on earth. You look at Quincy Jones, I'm sure you guys remember the, you know, We Are the World song, the best selling single of all time. The biggest singers on earth, Michael Jackson, Aretha Franklin, all come to Quincy Jones for that leadership. That's the kind of person he is. Or you look at Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, and the wealthiest people on earth go to them for that leadership. And what I've learned is I assume there had to be that one quality. But what I discovered is that there wasn't. Instead, every one of these leaders had a different quality, but that was so uniquely them, and so magnetic in its own way, that that's what made it work. And if you think about it, you know, if you go home tonight, and I, actually, this is a really good exercise. Go home tonight and make a list of the 10 people that you feel the most magnetized to. And then write down, you know, after you write down those 10 people, write down, you know, three characteristics of all of them that you admire the most. You will see some overlap, but you'll also notice some of them are completely different. You know, the reason people follow Bill Gates is, you know, when I was in the interview with Bill Gates, there was a point where he started, you know, just smiling, being like, I'm not a speaker like Steve. He was talking about Steve Jobs. And even Bill Gates understands that the reason people follow him is not the reason people follow Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs has this vision and this ability to communicate that vision that was unprecedented. Bill Gates had this intellect and this strategic mind that no one could come close to. And the biggest thing that I would say for you personally, that I want you to really soak up and understand, is that it's not about figuring out what makes someone else so great that you can then 
replicate. It's about figuring out what makes you you and doubling down on that. There's this amazing story that I came across that, again, it's one of these stories that you hear, I can't even remember where I heard it, but it's about Amazon and Walmart at the turn of the 20th, 21st century. So about, you know, 15 years ago. And, you know, in the beginning of the dot-com era, Walmart didn't think much of Amazon. But eventually, Amazon's market share started to grow, and Walmart got really nervous. So the Walmart executives all got together, and they just focused on, you know, what makes Amazon so good? Why are they winning? And they just tried to copy all of the Amazon strategies. They hired the best engineers. They poured all the money they could. Nothing seemed to work. So they hired even more, and then spent even more money. And still, nothing seemed to work. And as much as they tried to study Amazon strategies, they just couldn't figure it out. And then one day, a new Walmart executive walked into the office and looked around, and she understood what was going on. And the next day, she hung a banner across the wall, and Walmart's market share began to skyrocket. And what that banner said is, you can't out Amazon, Amazon. You can't out Amazon, Amazon. And the message of that story is essentially what your question gets to, which is that Walmart, to succeed, had to go back to figuring out what made them special in the first place. And again, that's not an easy question, too. I think a lot of people are like, focus on your strengths as if it's this easy thing that, you know, on the back of our pants it says our strengths. It takes a lot of work, a lot of introspection, years of trial and error to find out really what your next factor is. But there's nothing more important than figuring out what makes you you. Because once you figure that out, only then can you double down on it and achieve what you want to achieve. It's a really good question. All right, we've got our final one. Yes, what's your name? Mitch. Ever give Mitch some love? That's a big question with a big answer. If I had to make it super micro and almost focus on little things, and I agree with you, we, we definitely need an overhaul and rethinking how we're approaching this. Because I actually don't think we have an education problem, we have a culture problem. We don't have an education problem, we have a culture problem. And the culture problem is what you touched on, which is that we're so focused on training people to do what we want, that we're not allowing them to be who they are. And the beautiful thing about this whole third door mindset is that the whole essence of the analogy is that there's no single way. You know, for you, it might be going through the kitchen window. For you, it might be, you know, making friends with the bouncer. For you, it might be going, you know, through the back entrance, there's a different way for everyone. And the whole point is, it's not a blueprint. It's a mindset. And what I've learned about possibility is that with story, you can change what people believe is possible. And when you change what they believe is possible, you change what becomes possible. So, you know, a very simple thing that I've done, whether with, you know, young people who are you know, in their early teens to executives at some of the biggest Fortune 500 companies is 
And if anyone's going through this, you're more than welcome to do this yourself. If you have kids who are going through this, you can do it with them. Anyone who's trying to figure out what their path is, who isn't feeling fulfillment, who wants to find even more fulfillment. And again, this isn't about a stage, you know, an age in life, it's about a stage in life. Anyone who wants really to focus their path and make it even more themselves. I have three things that you can do over the next 30 days that really makes a difference. And feel free to take out your phones and the notes and write this down because it's made such an impact in people's lives. And I call it the 30 day challenge. And this is a super practical thing that teachers can teach kids, leaders can teach you know, employees at their company, parents can teach their children, and this is how the 30 day challenge works. You go, go to a local pharmacy, go to your local Dwayne Reed and get one of those you know, $1 spiral notebooks. And it's actually important to get a brand new one that's completely fresh. And on the cover of that notebook, write 30 day challenge. And for 30 days straight, you're journaling on the same three prompts. And it's critically important that you find the same time of the day and you create a pattern. So whether you're doing this in the morning or in the night, you want to find the same time of the day and you want to do this for 30 days in a row. This isn't 30 days spread out over six months, it's 30 days back to back. Do not miss a day. And these are the three questions, right? The first one is, what excited me today? What excited me today? The second question is, what drained me of energy today? And the key to that question is not, you know, what didn't inspire me or what made me feel bad. It's what drained me of energy today. And the third and final question is, what did I learn about myself today? What did I learn about myself today? And I've seen some of the biggest CEOs do this. And you would think that at that point in someone's career, when they're the CEO and they're at the top of their game, that's when they don't have the time to do these things. But what I've learned is the best CEOs are the ones who have that intern mentality the whole way through. Because they know that only when you're growing can you stay at the top of your game. Because the second you get comfortable at the top is the second you begin to fail. And if there's one message I could share with you guys today as you guys move forward, not only with the rest of the conference today, but really with the rest of your careers, is that when you're starting out or when you're at the top of your field, at the end of the day, it's how much you're willing to focus on your growth. Because no matter how much your boss, no matter how much your coworkers or your co-founders care about where you're going, no one's going to envision your vision the way you envision it. So I want to thank you guys. I want to thank the chamber. I want to thank Innovative for having me. You guys are fucking awesome. I love you guys. Thank you.